Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. Welcome to this week's episode of the People, Places, Planet Podcast. My name is Sarah Backer, and I'm your host. Some of you may remember the episode we did last spring, featuring our fantastic spring interns. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking to three of our equally wonderful summer interns. Their names are Anna Guzman, Natalie Triana, and Alex Alvarez. I will let them introduce themselves to you in a moment, but before we get started, I wanted to give a quick preface. This episode is mainly going to serve as a space for Anna, Natalie, and Alex to tell you about the independent research work that they have conducted while at ELI. Anna will be exploring substantive due process claims and climate litigation post dops Then, Natalie will talk to us about legal pathways for addressing climate migration from the Caribbean. Last but not least, Alex will dive into how local municipalities can legally address the needs of urban agriculture and community gardens. Without further ado, let's get started. Natalie, Anna, and Alex, thank you so much for being here with me today. Please go ahead and introduce yourselves. Thanks for having us. My name is Natalie Triana. I'm going to be a third year undergraduate at the University of Florida, and I'm double majoring in political science and economics with a minor in sustainability studies. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Guzman. I'm going into my senior year at the University of Chicago studying public policy and law, and I'm super excited to be here. Hi, Sarah. I am going to start my senior year at UC Berkeley soon. I am majoring in political science and history with a minor in conservation and resource studies, and I've really enjoyed my time here at ELI. Well, thank you for those great introductions. Now I would like to transition to the crux of our episode, the independent research projects. This is an opportunity that ELI gives to all interns to dive deep into a topic within the environmental legal realm. My first question is, how did you go about selecting a topic? Natalie, let's have you go first. I chose to do my work on climate migration from the Caribbean. And so I'm from South Florida. I was born and raised in Miami and I come from a Cuban family. I've really witnessed the impacts that climate change has had on my community and the Caribbean communities and the countries abroad. I really just became interested in trying to see how our immigration system can better address climate migration that might be happening in the future. Anna, how about you? So I was really interested in the significant developments in climate litigation that happened this summer, specifically with our children's trust cases in both Held versus Montana and Juliana versus United States. I was really struck by how much the landscape of the substantive due process claims that are made in that case has evolved and shifted since the decision of Dobbs last summer. I was really interested to dive deeper into the implications of the Dobbs decision on these due process issues. And finally, Alex? The idea for my independent research project stems from an experience I had after my freshman year of college. I had the opportunity to serve in the California Climate Action Corps as a fellow in the Bay Area. And as a part of my fellowship, I had to visit numerous community garden sites and urban agriculture operations. And during my visits, folks on the ground often mentioned that they felt local law and municipal law did not work for their operations, and in a sense was preventative of some of their work. So I came here to learn about how environmental law and policy could be best molded for the needs of communities, especially communities interested in urban agriculture. Well, that is quite a range of topics, and I'm excited to dive deeper, starting with Anna and due process post ops My question was again looking to explore how the fundamental right to a stable environment has really changed over time, specifically after the 2022 decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And so for a little bit of background, I first looked to dive into the substantive due process clause claim that is at the center of what the plaintiffs in the Juliana case were really looking to seek. They were specifically looking to define a fundamental right to a stable environment under the substantive due process. 
substantive due process is a principle allowing courts to prevent government interference with fundamental rights. It's based on the premise that the Constitution protects the public from unwarranted government intrusion, which infringes upon certain fundamental rights. And so if a government passes a law that infringes on life, liberty, or property rights, a substantive due process analysis must be performed to determine if that right raises to the level of a fundamental right, which is owed more protection under the Constitution. For example, in 1925, in the case of Pierce versus Society of Sisters, the court recognized a fundamental right for individuals to direct the education and upbringing of their children based on the 14th Amendment's due process clause. Additionally, in 1952, in Roshan versus California, the court again recognized a fundamental right to bodily integrity. And in 2003, in Lawrence versus Texas, the court recognized a fundamental right to sexual intimacy. There are dozens of cases that use substantive due process to establish different fundamental rights, and a lot of them have to do with concepts of bodily autonomy, dignity, and integrity having to do with one's person and personhood. Juliana uses this substantive due process clause to claim that there is a fundamental right to a stable climate capable of sustaining life and that the government infringed upon that fundamental right and deprived the plaintiffs in that case of their substantive due process when it continued to take actions that promoted the climate crisis through their energy policy. I was really interested in learning more about how substantive due process analysis establishes fundamental rights. There are two main frameworks that are used by the court throughout history to establish a fundamental right. The first one was established in 1997, and this is a quite cautious and narrow definition of what constitutes a fundamental right. In Washington versus Glucksburg in 1997, the court held that there was no fundamental right to assisted suicide in the United States. There were two prongs that the court recognized in establishing whether a liberty interest raised to the level of a fundamental right. They argued that a right needed to be first fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty, or secondly, deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. This is a quite narrow reading of the fundamental rights, and it's a standard used in the case of Dobbs. The court in Glucksburg cautioned future courts to exercise utmost care whenever breaking new ground and defining new fundamental rights that hadn't been previously recognized by the court. They were concerned that the liberty protected by the Due Process Clause would be transformed into a mechanism through which the policy preferences of the Supreme Court could be realized. This is a similar caution that the opinion in Dobbs used to continue to limit the reach and the scope of substantive due process. In contrast to the standard established in Glucksburg is that in a Obergefell versus Hodges, which was a court opinion in 2015. In that case, the petitioners argued that there was a fundamental right to marry, similar to the other fundamental rights that had been previously recognized by the Substantive Due Process Clause. And the court agreed. They held that there was a fundamental right to marry that was guaranteed to same-sex couples by the Due Process Clause. This case revised the narrow Glucksburg standard. The Obergefell court encouraged future courts to look to other trends and other factors in determining whether a fundamental right was present within any liberty interest. For example, they urged future courts to look to factors like changing attitudes or changing national opinions about certain concepts, making the argument that the due process clause is not a standard that was meant to be set in stone, but was rather meant to evolve as generations and different groups of Americans changed over time. This really introduces a more broad understanding of substantive due process and is the one that's relied upon in the case of Juliana versus United States. The plaintiffs in this case are arguing to the court that there is a fundamental right to a stable climate capable of sustaining human life, which unquestionably meets the standard under either the Obergefell or the Glucksburg framework for determining and defining a constitutional fundamental right. 
Juliana asks the question of whether the right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life is deeply rooted in this nation's history and traditions, which is the first prong of the Glucksberg test. The plaintiffs in the Juliana case find that it unequivocally is. They point to a number of different documents and traditions that prove that nature, the ecosystem, and the protection of the environment has been deeply intertwined into the founding of the country and national identity. The petition by the plaintiffs points to John Locke's two treatises of government, which argues that at the core of the Constitution is a system of intergenerational ethics focused on the preservation of the human species. They also point to a speech by James Madison in 1818, which expounded the importance of the balance and symmetry of nature and nature's laws. They even point to the Declaration of Independence itself, arguing that the protection of the environment and the role that the environment plays in American understandings of nationality and national identity is very central to even the Declaration of Independence. Secondly, the plaintiffs in the case of Juliana question how the right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life is implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. And again, they argue that it unequivocally is. They point to the fact that the Supreme Court has long championed recognizing rights necessary to preserve other fundamental rights. They argue that a stable climate system is quite literally the foundation of society without which there would be neither civilization nor progress. They argue that the rights to life, liberty, and property depend upon preservation of a climate system that is capable of sustaining human life, including the rights to touch upon deeply personal choices, which are central to individual dignity and autonomy. So the plaintiffs and their experts make clear that individual dignity and autonomy is really compromised by the climate destabilization they face. For example, drought and lack of water forced one of the plaintiffs from her home on the Navajo Nation Reservation and eliminated her ability to harvest important traditional plant medicines. And extreme heat forced her to stay inside when she would rather make the personal choice to be outdoors. And so cases like Juliana construe the due process clauses of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment as recognizing that the liberty interests protected are not frozen in time, but that they can adapt to new circumstances like climate change as the understanding of the climate crisis continues to evolve. And this is exactly the living constitutionalism standard that Obergefell encouraged. However, the 2022 decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization marks a return to an originalist interpretation of substantive due process. It argues that the 14th Amendment's protections of freedoms that are not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution must be limited to those rights that were understood to exist deep in the country's history. Instead of looking to current trends, Dobbs looks instead to the attitudes and opinions in 1868 when the 14th Amendment was ratified. So this rigid adherence to Glucksburg's deeply rooted standard distances the current court standing on substantive due process from the Obergefell living constitutionalism. Litigation is still ongoing in the Juliana case, and the government has responded in different motions after the Dobbs opinion has been released. And the government has argued that there is no history or tradition centered in the Juliana case. And they argue that the petitioners can cite no case where the judiciary has previously recognized such a broad right as the right to a particular climate system. And for this reason, they argue that there is not grounds for making a substantive due process clause argument and recognizing a new fundamental right in the Juliana case. This cautions an unsteady future for cases within the realm of climate litigation that rely upon substantive due process to make important arguments about bodily integrity, autonomy, and dignity as it relates and intersects with environmental issues and climate destabilization. Well, thank you, Anna, for providing such a nuanced and detailed overview. Let's move on to Natalie's project. Thanks, Sarah. I chose to look into the legal migration pathways that exist in the U.S. for people being impacted by climate change abroad. And so I was particularly interested in focusing on the Caribbean region, both because of my personal connection to that region, but also because so many countries and territories in the Caribbean are some of the most vulnerable to climate change impacts, especially in the sense of sea level rise, extreme heat, and of course, natural disasters. We saw in 2017 alone that nearly 2 million people in the Caribbean were displaced from one Atlantic hurricane season. 
I also thought that the U.S. was in an important position to address climate displacement because the Caribbean diaspora is so extensive in our country, especially in Florida and New York. So when we think about places that migrants might have social and financial support and where it might be easier for them to settle into new communities and have legal protections, the U.S. is really one of those main places. We also know that the U.S. has had many diplomatic relations and foreign policies with the Caribbean. We've provided humanitarian aid and relief for natural disasters and environmental impacts. And so I really thought that it was a place that could maybe open the door to better integrating climate migration into our immigration system and serving as a case study for other countries. So is there a legal definition today for a climate migrant? So not really a legal definition. In general, the definition of a climate migration is the movement of people from one location to another for reasons due to climate change, either in the form of slow onset impacts like sea level rise or sudden impacts like natural disasters. But there's a lot of talk and it's definitely a difficult conversation over what should count as a climate migrant versus a climate displaced person or a climate refugee. A climate refugee would be someone who is fleeing because of climate change, but also would kind of imply that they would have to be seeking refugee status versus a climate displaced person who has been displaced suddenly from their home because of a climate change related impact versus climate migrant is a much more inclusive term it might take into account economic decisions as well, political decisions. And I think these are all valid things to consider within the scope of climate migration, just because climate change impacts like drought and flooding and sea level rise do have economic impacts. And so I kind of use these terms interchangeably, but it's really important to think about what definition the U.S. might want to use in their policies going forward. In general, what I found was that there really is limited pathways for people who are trying to flee their country because of climate change impacts. One of the ways that the U.S. has is, of course, their refugee and asylum seeking system. And so the U.S. refugee definition is based on the 1951 convention. This was really the hallmark of refugee law, and it protects migrants who flee their country because of persecution or fear of persecution due to race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. However, it really doesn't account for other humanitarian issues, such as climate change or ongoing violence and armed conflict. And this has been something that people have felt for a long time should be expanded. There are a few ways where climate migrants might be able to fit into this definition. For example, environmental defenders who are persecuted for their political beliefs might be able to file a claim for persecution. And we've seen a small amount of these cases in Haiti, but primarily cases in Central America. Additionally, marginalized communities such as indigenous groups or people living in rural areas, if they receive less climate relief from their governments, they might be able to also file a claim for persecution. But overall, these claims are pretty few and far between. So one way that I found that this might be resolved is really by expanding the refugee definition, which is, of course, an ambitious goal. We've seen other countries like the EU, Australia, Mexico, Canada, and many more have two-pronged asylum assessments where they use both the 1951 refugee definition but they also provide complementary protection for other reasons outside of that. For example, we saw the 1984 Cartagena Declaration offer protection to people facing internal conflicts or events that seriously disturb public order. And these are choices of language that are broad enough to really encompass climate change impacts and allow for people who might be migrating for environmental reasons. Unfortunately, this solution might not be politically feasible in the U.S., but it's definitely the most long-lasting solution and one of the most inclusive alternatives for offering more protection to climate migrants. But another way that the U.S. addresses climate displacement is through Temporary Protected Status, or TPS for short. TPS allows people who are in the U.S. to remain in the U.S. if they can't return home to their country safely because of either ongoing armed conflict, environmental disasters, or extraordinary and temporary conditions. Now, there's a few limitations with this option. For one, it only offers protection to people who are already in the U.S. when the designation is made. This can create barriers for people who are migrating after environmental disasters, especially when they're happening so frequently in regions like the Caribbean. 
this provision could be changed and the U.S. might want to think about offering TPS to people entering the country for maybe a certain period of time after that initial designation is made. TPS is a short-term solution. It expects people to migrate back to their countries eventually. However, we're seeing that in the case of Haiti, TPS has been in place for 10 years, so it's pretty evident that some of the conditions preventing people from returning safely to their country aren't really resolving very quickly. And so that really pushes us to question whether we should be creating pathways to seek permanent permanent residency for people who have been in the country under TPS for so long. In the case of climate change, we really need to consider whether there will ever be a time where ongoing natural disasters, flooding, sea level rise are no longer temporary. And if so, we might want to change this language to better provide protection to people facing the continuous impacts of climate change. One of the last options that exists in the U.S. for addressing climate migration is our parole system. And so this is a designation that can allow migrants from a certain country to stay in the U.S. temporarily if there's urgent humanitarian reasons or significant public benefits for remaining in the country. So, for example, Biden announced parole in January for Cuba, Haiti and Nicaragua. However, parole was only really granted to people with U.S. financial sponsors, which also creates a barrier for entry. Again, humanitarian parole is still a temporary option. There's still the question about whether there should be pathways for seeking permanent residency for people who are being granted parole. What some other countries have done that's very similar to our parole system is humanitarian visas, and they've used these visas as a way to expedite the asylum-seeking process. For example, Brazil provided humanitarian visas to Haiti after the 2010 earthquake, and they actually allowed people who had this visa, if they were seeking asylum, to get expedited refugee status almost on a prima facie basis. Humanitarian visas are promising because they also provide opportunities for people to seek academic scholarships, to work legally in a country, and that really opens the doors for people being displaced by climate change. We're also really seeing these new visa proposals being thought about in the U.S. So, for example, Senator Ed Markey proposed bills in 2019 and 2021 that not only address climate migration head on, but established a separate visa that would allow for 50,000 climate displaced people every year. And of course, these bills didn't pass, but I still thought it was really prominent that they're being brought to the table here in the U.S. So overall, the main takeaway that I got from my research is that there really needs to be more thought on how our immigration system can address climate migration. And there's really some big questions that still remain. How do we address the slow long-term impacts of climate change, like sea level rise, instead of only addressing natural disasters and sudden events? Additionally, how do we provide long-term solutions that allow people to remain in the U.S. and integrate into new communities should they choose to do so? And lastly, how do we respect people's dignity and human rights during the immigration process? And what legal protections can we actually provide to people once they reach the U.S.? And so at the end of the day, migration is never an easy decision. Most people really don't want to leave their communities. However, we're seeing more and more people forced to move because of climate impacts as well. Thanks, Natalie. And this discussion is a perfect opportunity to promote ELI's work on migration with dignity which provides the framework for how to consider the dignity of migrants while they move and improve their transition in new settings, which will be increasingly important as climate change worsens. And now to discuss urban gardening, let's turn to Alex. I had to narrow down my research to a question. How can Bay Area cities address the needs of community gardens and urban agriculture in their municipal codes? A case study of two cities, specifically Richmond, California and Berkeley, California, best fit the time constraints I had with this project. Before I get into the findings of my research, we'll just talk about the significance of community gardens and urban agriculture. Urban agriculture and community gardens have a number of benefits for the local community. They can be sites of learning about nutrition and ecosystems. They can provide health benefits in the form of mental health and nutritional benefits. And for those communities that are located in food deserts, community gardens can provide fresh produce that they typically couldn't access at their local grocery store. Additionally, they can serve as sites of urban greening, provide habitat for local ecosystems, and if they're large enough, they can provide employment permanently. 
To do this research, I started with a case study, and I went back to one of the organizations I worked with as a fellow, and that is Urban Tilth, based out of Richmond, California. With my interview with Doria Robinson, the executive director of Urban Tilth, we talked about some of the challenges Urban Tilth and other community gardens throughout the Bay Area face day to day. Number one, she mentioned their complicated water arrangement. They had to form complicated water agreements with both the city and local school district to acquire affordable water year around. Second of all, there's a substantial amount of time that Urban Tilth spends on meeting permit requirements and meeting permit fees, which is both a time drain and a money drain for their community organization. And additionally, they experience issues with food distribution and sales. Simply put, the legal arrangement of Richmond, California makes it preventative for community gardens to sell and buy produce. And then going off this case study and some of my findings from my conversation with Doria Robinson, I did a survey of both cities' municipal codes. I noticed 10 qualities overall that were either present or not present in the city codes of Richmond and Berkeley, California. The first quality I want to highlight is the presence of an urban agriculture ordinance. Thankfully, both cities had urban ag ordinances on the books. And these ordinances are so important because they provide the enabling language to allow urban agriculture and community gardens within their jurisdictions. Second of all, Richmond, California did not have permit distinctions based on scale, while Berkeley, California did. And this is important because there are certain barriers to scaling up and barriers to entry into community gardening and urban agriculture. When permits are approached with one-size-fits-all policies, like that of Richmond, California, that creates barriers for smaller organizations or smaller communities who are interested in starting community gardening compared to those who may be in the business for 10 to 20 years now. I would like to highlight another quality, which is programs to acquire land. Oftentimes community gardens and urban agriculture organizations have difficulty finding land within their cities. Richmond, California had an adopt a spot program on the books, while Berkeley, California didn't have anything comparable. Richmond's adopt a spot program is essentially an initiative that allows community organizations to steward pieces of public land within the city for a certain amount of time. I ended up at a set of prescriptions for both cities and then also for municipalities in general. I'll highlight a couple of them. Number one, Permits should have some distinction based on scale so that small community gardeners don't face a barrier to entry into community gardening. Second of all, there have to be some sort of special building regulations and built structure guidelines for community gardens and urban agriculture because they're located in municipalities that traditionally have not been sites of agriculture. And in general, there should be some sort of investigation on how municipalities can provide better and more accessible legal guidance for urban agriculture. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any pages dedicated to community gardens or urban agriculture on both cities' websites, so it was quite difficult for me to gather legal information about setting up community gardens and urban agriculture within those jurisdictions. And finally, I'm going to leave off with some questions to consider for policymakers and municipalities in general. When you're designing policies for urban agriculture and community gardens, consider how you can create accessible guidance for those community gardens and urban agriculture operations. Most of the folks involved in those community-based organizations don't have legal training and might face accessibility issues with finding information about how to set up those sites in the first place. Second of all, is your policy language restrictive or enabling? After my assessment, I found that most of the policy language I encountered regarded what community gardens could not do rather than what community gardens could do. And then last of all, how do your regulatory choices impact operational costs in the end? Most of these community gardens and urban agriculture sites are being set up by community-based organizations. And when you create certain barriers for authorization for community gardens and urban agriculture, that will prevent some folks from entering the scene in the first place.
Regarding my next steps, I plan to present this information to my city council member back in Berkeley after I move back from D.C. Alex, that is so exciting. You'll have to keep me posted on what your city council member says. Well, thank you all so much for being on the podcast today and for being at ELI this summer. And I'm excited to see what you'll do next. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you again for having us. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at ELI.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.